and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kisson. And this is the show for you if you're bored of people arguing on the internet over subjects they know nothing about. At Trigonometry, we don't pretend to be the experts, we ask the experts. Our fantastic expert guest this week is a journalist and a researcher at Sheffield University, Remy Adekoya. Welcome to Trigonometry. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. We, we really look forward to talking to you. And before we get into the meat and the substance of what we talk about, tell us a little bit about how you're here, what's been your background, uh, just a little bit about that for our viewers so they know who you are. Well, I was born in uh, Nigeria to a Nigerian father and a Polish mother. I grew up in Nigeria, went to a primary, secondary school in Nigeria. And then after that, in the late 90s, I moved to Poland, which was where my mom was from. I uh, went to university in Poland, first studied law, but uh, couldn't find myself as a lawyer. And then later on moved into journalism, <clears throat> became a political journalist in Poland. I really enjoyed that. But I decided uh, to move to the UK about three years ago and do a PhD here in politics, in political science. So that's, um, uh, that's about it. And we talked a little bit about what you're researching. You talked about group identity, which, mm -hmm. which is something we'll touch on, mm -hmm. I'm sure. And, uh, but uh, tell us a little bit about your political kind of evolution, uh, how you ha came to have the views that we'll be talking about a little bit as well. well which views exactly do you mean? Well, uh, why, why don't we just get into the views, then that'll yeah. be a lot easier. Uh, for anyone who hasn't uh, discovered Remy until this point, you wrote an article for, Qu you write for The Guardian as well, mm -hmm. but you wrote an article for Quillette, mm -hmm. which I think uh, got a lot of people's attention, including mm -hmm. ours. Mm -hmm. And for anyone who hasn't read it we'll put it in in the in the YouTube below mm -hmm. but tell us a little bit about what was the kind of the gist the crux of your article for anyone who hasn't seen it well the crux of the article was essentially was based on a conversation essentially I had with a friend of mine a black friend of mine and it was about how uh, we discuss race when I say we I mean black people uh, in public and in private and how there's a big difference usually and there are calculations which are made regarding what we should say in public and what we shouldn't say in public. These calculations are essentially based on how uh, many black people view our interests. So essentially, I'd say maybe on self-preservative instincts. Like I wrote in the article about how, okay, I was talking to this friend of mine, <clears throat> and he was complaining about a black friend of his at the workplace who sort of, you know, plays the race card anytime there's a, on com there's a difficult situation with a white person, yeah? The friend is like, friend of my friend, is like, oh, you know, bring out the race card, and most likely, 99% of the time, a white person will back down. Mm. <clears throat> so my friend told me, oh, he found, finds this disgusting, doesn't like it, this is completely wrong, etc. And in this conversation we're having, I said, yeah, exactly. So that's why we have to start criticizing this, you know, black identitarians and people sort of, you know, trying to essentially leverage uh, some of the horrors which our ancestors went through for some form of advantage today, mm. okay? Mm. And then my friend said, well, actually, um, uh, I don't agree with you on that, you know? And I'm like, you know, why? But you just said now that you don't like people uh, leveraging, uh, leveraging race like this. And he says, yeah, but actually, if you look at the big picture, you'll find out that, look, he says, look, let's think about it. How many of us black people are there here in the UK, okay? About 5% of the population. Do we have a lot of economic and political power? No, we don't, okay? That's the reality. Now, what is actually preventing the white population, about 87%, who control almost all the political and economic power, from actually dominating us overtly? My friend asks me. The only thing that's stopping them from doing that is the fear of being called racist, yeah? Is political correctness, is the restraint which has been placed on them by society regarding how they should talk to minorities, yeah? And he says, that's the only saving grace we actually have. And he says, take that away, and what do we have? Take that away, and we could have a situation like we had in the 70s and the 80s, okay? Where people on the road are, you know, using the N-word freely. Mm. And don't feel afraid to do that, because there's, you know, no social ostracism, no social consequences from doing that. So they're gonna, people are gonna be doing it. And he's like, what was interesting here, my friend, who is a very intelligent guy, very successful banker in city in London, and I said, it's not because, you know, white people are evil or something like that. But he said, that's simply human nature. Mm -hmm. If you put people in a position of dominance over another group of people, and there are no checks, 
okay, they are going to abuse that position. Mm -hmm. okay. So his argument is essentially that you need white guilt to protect minorities. Yes, that without white guilt, we'd be in a much more difficult situation here. And essentially, you know, white people sort of wouldn't um, uh, have any restraints towards, you know, talking to us anyhow, mm -hmm. or using, exploiting that advantage which they do have over us in numbers, in political power, in economic power, etc. So he's like, you know, that's the only restraint. So he sees that as a sort of necessary evil. He's mm -hmm. like, I don't like it aesthetically, um, morally, I don't really like it, but I think we need it, you know, in order to protect ourselves because it's all we've got. If we let go of that, if we black people start criticizing identity politics, black identitarians, then and mainstream white society says, well, you know, since it seems that you know, even black people don't agree with these identitarians, then, you know, maybe why bother with this whole, you know, political correctness thing? Mm. And he's like looking at that in the long term, it's actually going to be bad for us. And what do you make of that argument, sorry, Francis? Look, that argument, um, uh, I'd be lying if I told you at that argument, I was like, oh, that's rubbish. Uh, it's an argument which made me think. I actually, you know, started imagine, imagining certain scenarios. I started actually thinking, okay, fine. What if tomorrow now, you know, political correctness was simply, you know, dubbed unnecessary by mainstream white society, because there's obviously already a segment of society which says it's rubbish. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking of mainstream, majority, 60, 70 percent of the people. What if they actually said political correctness is rubbish? Actually, we should be able to say anything we like, more or less, uh, to black people, etc. Would that be a more uh, pleasant environment for me to live in, being a minority here in numbers? I can't imagine it being, mm -hmm. yeah, if that were to be the case, if it were to go in that direction that people would want to exploit that advantage. Uh, so, like I said, I couldn't, I definitely didn't, you know, think what my friend was saying was rubbish, but I thought about it, and the thing is, you know, maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's naive or something, but based on my experiences with, especially people here in the UK, because I've had different experiences also in Poland, that's a different kettle of fish, but based on my experience with people here in the UK, I do believe fundamentally that a majority of the white population here does not have racist instincts and would not exploit to their advantage, yeah, if, you know, the whole race thing and the numbers advantage they have and the political advantage they have, if, say, political correctness theoretically was to disappear. That's what I believe, that there's a fundamental decency mm. in most people who live here. I believe that two, three hundred percent, based on experiences which I've had, based on experiences, I'm married to a Nigerian wife, my wife is 100% Nigerian. She's actually lived in the UK a bit longer than me, counting and the intervals and all that. And based on her experience also, you know, based on things we talk about, based on experiences of some other people, when we actually sit down and talk, because, you know, sometimes black people may complain about racism here. But, you know, when we sit down, when I say we, we, when we black people sit down in the room, you know, and I'm like, yeah, but guys, come on, you know, these people really, they're not that bad. They're actually pretty tolerant. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, they're actually pretty tolerant. They're like, yeah, yeah, of course we know, you know. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we can't, uh, we shouldn't sort of say that out. We sort of have to keep up that moral pressure, yeah, just to make sure they don't one day take it into their heads to start exploiting those advantages of us and treating us the way they used to treat us 20, 30 years ago. So it's not like people don't know this. It's not like a lot of people who might even, you know, retweet um, a black identitarian, you know, for lack of a better term, um, post on Twitter saying, maybe not the most radical ones, but let's just say something sort of insinuating that there's a lot of racism in, in the UK. It's not like every black person who retweets that actually really believes it's that bad. OK, but it's just part of, you know, keeping up this pressure and part of, you know, trying to sort of um, secure, protect ourselves from this white power, which a lot of people actually fear, you know. And as I argued in the uh, in the piece, there's historical reasons, of course, for that fear. But doesn't the rise of something of someone like Trump in the US yeah. mean that their fears are actually well founded? Because although obviously I'm not black, I'm half Latin American, yeah. and when Trump came out and did the speech and talked about Mexicans and said, you know, illegal immigrants, some of them are racist, mm -hmm. uh, some, are, some are, sorry, some of them are rapists, immediately I had a sinking sensation inside, mm -hmm. and if I went to the US in certain areas, I wouldn't feel comfortable speaking Spanish, which is my second language. Mm. Of course, and, uh, you know, there's no pretending 
I know we'd be silly to pretend here that there's, you know, no such thing as racism or oh, it's a very, you know, marginal thing, which, you know, only 5 percent of the white population, you know, um, uh, uh, subscribe to and all that. No, that's not the way it is. It's something which is very real and exists among uh, more than 5 or 10 percent of the white population in a standard, let's say, um, a Western society. So, of course, that exists. And Trump, paradoxically, uh, has only strengthened, you know, identity politics among minority, um, uh, minority sort of intellectuals, because they're like, see, we told you guys. You guys were saying these white people, you know, that um, uh, they are not that racist, they're not that bad, et cetera, et cetera. Now, do you see? Look who they voted for. They voted for a guy who said all the things he said. So even the black people before, uh, I focus here on black people, that's the community I know, obviously the other minority groups, even the black people before who were sort of neutral or didn't buy into those narratives that, oh, essentially every second white person is racist, you know, sort of now feel sometimes a little bit silly, thinking, oh, actually, I was naive, yeah? It seems these white folk are actually pretty racist. I mean, they did vote for this Trump guy who said all those things. So, you know, maybe I was the one who was naive and not these identity politics guys, yeah? Maybe they were the ones who were right, yeah? And there's some others who say, yeah, well, of course, you know, Trump doesn't represent all white people, et cetera, et cetera. But since there is such a political force right now, we definitely need to stand on the side of our people, okay, and defend our people who are being attacked by this kind of politics. So even if we don't agree 90 or much less 100 percent with the black identitarians, we definitely need to hold the line with them because, you know, these are the guys fighting for us. Definitely Trump is not fighting for us. And the people who support Trump are definitely not fighting for us. OK? So it's sort of a, it's, it's, it's bad for people like me. Bad is a strong word. It's difficult for people like me because now there's a line drawn, yeah? So you say, you know, are you with them or are you with us? Yeah. OK? Are you with the Trump folk who are saying the things they're saying? Or are you with us who are trying to, you know, sort of resist the Trump folk, you know? So it's, um, uh, it's tricky right now. It was the polarizing effect of Trump. It pushes everyone into the uh, corner, yeah. uh, doesn't it? But, uh, I mean, in terms of... It's interesting because Donald... One thing Donald Trump always talks about is that black unemployment is the lowest that it's been mm. for decades or mm. whatever, wherever, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, Donald Trump got more of the ethnic minority vote than any of the previous Republican candidates for, for decades as well. Not mm. necessarily. Okay. Uh, he got 29% um, uh, of the yeah. Hispanic vote, mm -hmm. which is roughly the percentage any Republican candidate um, uh, yeah. gets. Is roughly what McCain got. McCain even got more, yeah. I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, so he didn't get a larger percentage of the Hispanic vote. Uh, he didn't get a larger percentage of the black vote. Mm. What happened was that much fewer minority voters, especially black voters, came out to vote in 2016 mm. for Hillary Clinton. They simply stayed at home. Right. Oh. Okay? So in the, when, 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 when Obama was there, and even when Clinton was there, okay, Bill Clinton, Bill. I mean, uh, sort of minority voters, black voters, were more mobilized to come out and vote. Mm. But Hillary Clinton was not able to mobilize um, ethnic minority voters, especially black voters. So it's not necessarily the case that Trump got a higher percentage of those, you know, that minority vote than a regular Republican candidate would get. But Hillary Clinton got less than definitely what Obama got in, 20, in 2008 and 2012. And do you think the rise of identity politics is a positive thing? Do you think it's helped us? It's become made us more aware? Or do you think it's ultimately quite divisive? What do you mean by us? Uh, sorry, um, as in all of us, so, all of us society. Okay, that, so that is, it's important to um, uh, to know what you're talking yeah, no, about. Absolutely. Um, uh, definitely, if you say all of us society has identity politics um, uh, helped us, I would say, um, <clears throat> you know, first of all, it depends, you know, how we define this identity politics. Now, if we define, for instance, what Martin Luther King was doing in the late '60s as identity politics, and there are definitions of identity politics by which we could describe really? that as identity politics, in the sense of um, focusing on the interests of a specific ethnic group, okay, and articulating those interests in, uh, in political fashion, mm. but these were interests of a specific ethnic group, yeah. okay, which he was focused on, mm. yeah? Uh, later on, he actually started talking about a lot about poverty and all that, which 
encompass all ethnic groups. But let's just say most of his work, and definitely what he's associated with, is on defending black interests. Mm. Yeah, that's the way it is. If we describe that as identity politics, then I would definitely say it has helped, because it brought a larger degree of fairness in U.S. society for a specific group of people. Yeah, no one would criticize the civil rights movement <laughs> yeah. today. I mean, yeah. some, some would. <laughs> <laughs> some, 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 some. Francis might. <laughs> <laughs> some, oh, oh. <laughs> we'll have a talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, anyway, so. guys, it's been nice knowing you. Uh, I'm off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, Francis' so, career is over now, which <laughs> makes me incredibly happy. <laughs> you know, so, um, so yeah, so if, so yeah, so again, if we yeah. look at that or something, mm. if we look at, but obviously when we talk about identity mm. politics today, we are not thinking about that, yeah? yeah? We're thinking about identitarian politics. I don't want to start naming names and, you know, people basically coming out and, you know, bringing up um, uh, terms like, you know, white privilege and white fragility. And essentially, you know, if a white person doesn't, agree with uh, 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 as let's say me a black person's um, a definition of racism that means that black that white person is racist mm. yeah which is absolute rubbish in my own opinion mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, that kind of identity politics or focusing sort of solely because even when Martin Luther King was articulating um, uh, his arguments for why black people should be treated fair in America these uh, his arguments were based on a broad understanding of universal human rights in America. Right. Yeah. He was essentially saying, look, the American Constitution said all men are created equal. Mm. So how come it seems now that that doesn't apply to black men? Yeah. Okay. So he was essentially sort of appealing to a universal, um, uh, uni universal human rights, universal sense of decency. Let's just call it that, what it is. Right now, we don't have that. There's no appeal that, oh, well, actually, um, uh, we just want, you know, black people to be treated uh, how everybody else is treated and all that. It's more essentially like, oh, well, you know, there's this loads of bad things which have happened, slavery, colonialism, racism, institutionalized racism in the 60s, 70s, 80s, etc. Uh, black people have, you know, suffered from this. White people, it seems, don't want to recognize this. And, you know, sometimes I wonder, you know, when they say sort of like white people don't want to recognize which white people are you talking about? Is it until every single white person on this planet Earth acknowledges the evils of racism, slavery, etc., that we will finally say, oh, yeah, aha, okay, now it's okay? Mm -hmm. Because I mean, what? How many white people have to acknowledge these things for it to be accepted that, oh, white people have acknowledged these things? I don't know if you're following the argument um, uh, I'm making. Yes, no, absolutely. No, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just, like, yeah, what do you absolutely. need? You need 99%, yeah. 95, yeah. or it's 92, okay? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. yeah. Because, you know, I would definitely argue that a majority, definitely in Western societies, have acknowledged this, yeah. okay? Yes. And there have been books written about this. There have been films made about this. Even laws which are created, for instance, in, um, uh, in the country. I mean, governments speak about this. That's what I mean. Well, Tony Official. Blair apologized for <clears throat> racism many years ago. Tony Blair apologized for racism. Uh, not for racism, for slavery. <clears throat> yeah. For slavery. Yeah. Uh, Theresa May, um, uh, there, was a, there was a government report which came out last, um, I think it was 2017, uh, talking about you know, disparities in socioeconomic outcomes. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. And the report very clearly stated that, look, there is a link here between race and huge disparities in socioeconomic outcomes, mm -hmm. okay, in the UK, yes. regarding employment, regarding housing, etc. And we need to tackle this, okay? This is a Tory government, for God's sake. Yeah. And they've acknowledged that. So what else do you want, sort of? How many people have to say, oh, yes, this is a problem, we acknowledge it? But it's a clever argument from their point of view because they can actually push the argument until the last white man acknowledges that <laughs> slavery was bad, yeah. <laughs> yeah. racism was bad, etc., which they know is never going to happen. Mm. Yeah. Okay? Which they know is never going to happen. There are always going to be white people who are going to try and, oh, well, you know... Well, you know, maybe not exactly, or maybe it wasn't that bad and all that. There are people who hold such views, mm -hmm. yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's an argument which they can essentially push for eternity. Mm. So it's a very clever tactic <laughs> in order to essentially advance their <clears throat> agenda, whatever that agenda Definitely, is. because you can always point, you can always find racists. Yeah. Always. Of course. You yeah, can yeah. always say, oh, uh, well, they say that racism doesn't exist in the West anymore, but look at what politician A said. Mm. Yeah. And look at what Minister X said. Mm. Is that not racism? Yeah. Which shows you there's still a problem, mm. okay? So it's then magnified and portrayed as a problem, as in something which affects 
or, or that these are views shared by uh, a large group of people, whereas it's one individual, for, for instance, who made a statement. Yeah. I, I think part of the problem for me is, is that how we don't discuss it. Like, your article I loved. I thought it was brilliant, and I said to Constantine, this is great, we, ne we need to get you on the show. Mm. And I shared it with one of my friends who's mixed race. Yeah. We have never spoken about it. Yeah. And he, he has never mentioned it or, 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 or any shape or form. Mm. And d did you feel a pushback d from, from that article? Uh, did from, uh, from uh, to, to, to be honest, um, um, there are a lot of people who really know what's going on and see the BS of the identitarians, OK? So the answer to your question is that the overwhelming majority of like, let's say, the people on my social media feed, etc., black people, etc., didn't, you know, criticize me for that or say, oh, that's wrong. We disagree with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Some openly said, this is exactly what I thought all this while. Okay. Some kept quiet, but definitely didn't like unfollow me or something like that. I mean, continued the engagement with me. Mm -hmm. uh, and but there were definitely a few who, um, uh, one term which I'd remember, which, you know, I'd be pretty, you know, we all try to act as if, you know, we're tough and we don't care what other people say and all that and all mm -hmm. that, uh, which is generally the way it should be, but it's not the way, you know, emotionally we are as people, yeah? Mm -hmm. So when, for instance, you know, someone who had uh, been a good friend of mine, uh, at least, you know, social media and all that, you know, told me, oh, they were disappointed in me for writing that, uh, I'd be lying if I said, you know, that didn't make me sort of like, hmm, Like, wow, uh, let me rethink actually what I just said and what might be the effects for people. Because, you know, it's easy to write something, but there are consequences for what you write, especially if, let's say, the article, you know, is read by more than a few people. Uh, there are real consequences for people in real life, or at least they may perceive, those people may perceive that there may be, con there may be consequences. So what I'm essentially saying is that there were only a few people who sort of, you know, pushed back and said, you know, this is wrong, uh, which of which I said the most sort of, <clears throat> the one that, you know, really sort of, you know, made me stop and, you know, I think to everyone and said, oh, I'm disappointed in you, in the sense I expected more from you. But then I sat down and thought about it and said, okay, what does this actually mean? What does this person actually mean? What they actually mean is that I know what they mean. As a black person, I, I know how, I, I, I know the conversations that go on, you know, when there are no white people in the room. <laughs> I know, I know, I know what, what they essentially mean is that, look, we know, okay, what you wrote is the way it is. But at the end of the day, we can't trust these people, okay? We know what they've done to us in the past. We know what some of them are saying about us today. So how can you sort of reveal outside some of the strategies and tactics which we use in order to defend ourselves against them, okay? So it's essentially based on a fundamental emotional, very often, mistrust, mm -hmm. okay? That, look, at the end of the day, <laughs> this is why people don't really like us too much, okay? They might pretend, they might smile, they might even, because of certain laws, uh, you know, act as if they do, maybe even give us a couple of jobs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But fundamentally, in their deepest heart of hearts, these white people don't really like us too much for some reason. That's a strong belief which is held among many, many, uh, again, I'm speaking um, uh, black people, some super intelligent with huge degrees and all that and all that, even very successful. It's a fundamental belief which is deep down. You know, it's something which is emotional, okay? You can try to, uh, you can't inte intellectualize it. You can't argue with it on an intellectual level, you know? It's something which is based on emotion. Let me say, for instance, you know, this might, probably a, a flawed analogy, hugely flawed an analogy, but it's the way, for instance, uh, people in Israel, Jews, might react to, you know, um, uh, talk of, you know, surrounding, you know, the Holocaust or people sort of, um, uh, you know, anti-Semitic remarks, etc. You know, there is definitely, uh, I would argue, a feeling there among many Israeli Jews that, look, um, generally the group is under some kind of threat. We have a lot of enemies. Okay? There are people who hate us. There are people who want to see us exterminated, in fact, from this earth. And we have to be wary of them. Mm -hmm. Okay? 
we have to always be conscious of that, that these enemies exist. A lot of people don't like us. It's a feeling which exists. I think you guys would, um, uh, would agree with me. Even sometimes among intellectuals also, you know, Jewish intellectuals, etc., who theoretically we would say should know that, oh, you can't generalize like that. But, you know, these are emotions. Mm. Yeah? I think people feel it in the Labour Party at the <laughs> moment. Yeah, too. Feel, so, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that, uh, you know, so people, so, so these things exist. Yeah. So these feelings among black people, very often it's emotional, yeah? Mm. It's based from that something, you know, we've read those books about slavery, we've read those books about colonialism and all those things which happened, you know. And of course, another um, uh, point which is not usually raised today, which I know exists, is that a lot of our, let's say, um, what's the word I would use for it now? Not suspicion in this case, but... um, Awareness, you say. Awareness, awareness, we could say. Uh, or, and let's even say bringing in some resentment into it mm. is because of the fact that, you know, um, uh, we haven't been able to, as uh, black people, build many, or some might even argue any, uh, successful black nations, mm. powerful black nations, mm. okay? I guarantee you that if there were, say, five or six African economies, you know, two, three trillion uh, dollar um, uh, GDP economies with powerful armies, with nuclear weapons, believe me, black people wouldn't be half as sensitive Mm. to some of these uh, debates and some of these, let's say, insults which flow around as they are today, okay? So that, uh, that aggressive reaction also often stems from essentially a sense of fundamental weakness, Mm. group weakness, Mm. okay? There are obviously some hugely successful individual black people. There's the Obamas, there's the Oprah Winfrey's, the African billionaires, popular African musicians, etc. Okay? There's no doubt about that. Professionals, lawyers, etc. But as a group, if you're thinking in group terms, there is a sense of fundamental weakness there. Okay? And that is what also sometimes makes these reactions oversensitive. Yeah? Which, you know, because it's like, you know, if there's a classroom and a guy who is uh, one of the, you know, school boys who is, you know, really big, he's got muscles, etc. If, let's say, one of the smaller boys, you know, taunts him, you know, he essentially laughs it off. He doesn't take it serious, mm-hmm. you know. But if it goes the other way around, and it's the muscular jock, let's say, mm-hmm. who taunts the smaller skinny boy, the smaller skinny boy feels it much more, and he will react much more emotionally to it mm-hmm. because he's in that position of disadvantage and he doesn't feel strong. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I, I see it quite a lot with Venezuelan people mm. because of what's happening in Venezuela and the fact that the country has been so chronically mismanaged. Mm. And I, as a result, that there, there is that sense of, you know, frustration and also a sense of inferiority. And, mm-hmm. what's, and also when you talk with Venezuelan people, they, there's a sense, sometimes a sense of almost hopelessness of like, mm. we, we, we can't make it work mm. for whatever reason. Mm. I don't know if that's been your experience of what you've just discussed. Mm. That's just been mine when I talk to Venezuelan people mm. because of everything that's happening in Latin America and the fact mm. that the vast majority of countries simply aren't functioning. But that's, that's I find that surprising. I mean, in Venezuela, obviously, yeah. we, know, yeah. um, uh, we know the case, but I'm surprised you say that uh, might be happening in Latin America because there are countries there doing very well. I mean, Brazil is generally doing not badly. I mean, obviously, you know, corruption yeah. scandals yeah. and all that, but economically and all that, I mean, they've made huge strides. Yeah. I mean, Chile, socioeconomically, is not doing bad at all. Yeah. Uh, and there are a couple of other examples like that too. So I'm surprised you would say, do you think it's a regional thing or it's just a country? I, I, it may be just a country, maybe it's just a regional thing, but certainly the issue with corruption and mismanagement mm. Mm. and mainly because I talk about it from a Venezuelan point of view and mm. the fact that it's so wealthy like a lot of African countries but all rich of course but because of uh, corruption and mismanagement mm. it's imploding in mm-hmm. a sense yeah Marim you know what I was thinking as you were talking I mean it makes a lot of sense what you're saying, mm. but I and I couldn't blame a black person mm-hmm. for feeling the resentment mm-hmm. and, given everything that's mm-hmm. that's happened But it is tragic when Mm -hmm. you describe it in that way because I feel like fundamentally I don't see a way out of that, uh, of what you're talking about. If if essentially what you're saying is black people get together and they know that what you're saying in Mm. your article is true Mm. but they don't want to admit it because they're afraid and Mm -hmm. resentful. Mm -hmm. Uh, even though I guess we would be be in agreement that society is improving in terms of its treatment of minorities Mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. 
I, I don't see a way out of that. Do you? I do. Yeah. Uh, the way out of that is in um, uh, black group success, mm. not just individual success, in group success. As I told you, look, at the end of the day, uh, the key to all of this is Africa, mm. okay? Because Africa is the black continent. That is the only continent where essentially black people are the ones running the show. Yeah. Now, the, and the, you know, black thinkers, going back to Marcos Garvey, fella Nicolak Pokuti, a uh, um, personal um, uh, hero of mine, who was a Nigerian um, a musician and, and political activist, said this 50 years ago. They said, look, as long as Africa is not successful, the black person will not be respected anywhere in the world. Hmm. Okay? This is the prerequisite for blacks to be respected anywhere in the world. Hmm. There must be at least a couple of indisputably successful. Not, ah, well, you know, if we compare to where it was 20 years ago and that kind of relative kind of success. We're talking about indisputable success, okay? A France success, a Germany success, or a Japan success, or a China success, where nobody can argue and say it is anything other than a success. That's what we're talking about here. Now, that must happen. Uh, at least a couple of countries, yeah? There's you know, over 50 countries there, even if it's just four, five, six countries. Okay, that people can look at and say, look, these countries, good health care, good economies, strong, strong armies, etc. Success, like I said, the way we understand it um, here. Number one, what that will do, uh, the people there on the ground, let's say in Africa, <laughs> obviously will have much better lives. Two, there will be a much stronger sense of pride. You know, if you really have an innate sense of pride, nobody, an innate sense of dignity and self-worth, nobody can take that away from you. Okay? No names you are called can take that away from you. It can only be taken away from you if you don't actually really have it. Mm. If you are pretending to have it, but deep inside you don't really feel that way. Then if somebody calls you a name, you know, it affects you. Okay? You might not even say it out in public, but it affects you because you're thinking, oh, maybe that person is right, maybe I'm really worthless or not worth that more, that much. So one, it will give people a sense of self-worth there within Africa, okay? So then Africans, let's say, coming to the UK or to America or to the West, discussing, will discuss from a completely different psychological position, okay? It will be from a psychological position that, look, you guys, white people, have your successful countries here in Europe. Obviously, there are some much less successful countries here in Europe. We, black people in Africa, we also have our successful countries in Africa. And of course, there's some much less successful countries there, just like you guys also have here in Europe. So that will be a completely different psychological approach, a much more relaxed psychological approach, you see. Mm -hmm. so, so that's one. Two, if we talk about, uh, let's say, black, because a lot of this is actually pushed not even by people who were born in Africa and then moved to the West like me, but very often by black people who were actually born in the West. Right. Okay? Born in America or born here. <clears throat> so they also, I know, are affected by this fact that they know that these successful black nations don't really exist. Okay? And they too, if they were to see that, oh, well, there's, I don't know, um, uh, uh, Nigeria, which is one of the, let's say, becomes one of the biggest economies in the world. Um, uh, world leaders go there to pay homage to the Nigerian leader, etc. These visuals appear, okay? Uh, when there's some, you know, big global event, you know, people consult, oh, what does the Nigerian leader think? What does the South African leader think? What does the Kenyan leader think? After years of seeing this kind of images, you know, in TV and all that, and seeing that, look, this power balance which they speak of is becoming definitely more equal, okay? We do see that there are black nations which are strong and powerful. The black identitarians in the West here will also be sort of more relaxed, psychologically also, okay? They'll be more sure of themselves, and there'll be less of this sort of desperate need, you know, to sort of prove by bluster empty bluster, essentially, that, oh, yes, we are something, and we're going to show them that we're something. Because, you know, showing that you're something is not, you know, based on bluster, you know. The way the world is, is based on results which you have behind you, and the results of your group behind you, yeah? Perhaps it shouldn't be like that. In fact, I think it shouldn't be like that. I believe people should be respected, and groups should be respected for simply being, okay? But that's not how the world works. Mm -hmm. You know, Chinese people 30 years ago, I remember the jokes about the Chinese people 30 years ago. You guys, I mean, you would have definitely read about them also. 30 years ago, you know, China was the butt of, you know, world jokes, yeah? There was the joke of the poor Chinaman and all that, yeah? Nobody treated them seriously. They were dismissed. 
today, nobody would dare do that. Well, they own us. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you see, yeah? nobody, nobody would dare do that. Yeah. It didn't take a, a Chinese identitarian movement to come out and say, oh, do, you must respect them, uh, Chinese people, because we demand it. Mm. That's not the way it works, okay? The results came, the strength came, and people automatically respected. Mm. Nobody had to be asked. Today, nobody has to be asked to respect China. Mm. Do you think the West's idea of Africa as a whole is, uh, doesn't help the fact that, you know, you, you ask the average person on the street what they think about Africa and they would say, you know, it's poverty, it's corruption, it's, you know, it's divisions of wealth. It's a, do you think that, that is really quite damaging when it's, it's a country, it's, I'm sorry, it's a, it's a, a continent company. Well done, mate. Say, thank well you. Done, mate. There you go. Africa's Korea, a country, yeah. guys. You do well. You. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you can, if you, what you can hear is me sweating. Uh, you know, a continent with over you know, 50 countries, like yeah, you yeah. said, and you know, mm. some are more successful than others, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's quite simply a crude two-dimensional portrait. Definitely, but that is still not the core of the problem. The core of the problem is not what white people think about Africa. The core of the problem is what are the realities of Africa. Right, yeah. I don't care what white people think about Africa. Of course, I have to care because white people are influential and all that and all that. And of course, you know, what's shown on the news, on CNN, etc., is important. But what really matters are the realities on the ground there. Yeah. Yeah. If the socioeconomic realities on the ground there improve, life becomes better for people. The countries become stronger economically, etc. This narrative which you are talking about will also change. Because one thing which I can't stand, which um, uh, black identitarians do, is focus on the narrative aspect of things. And they say, oh, yeah, well, um, Africa is portrayed um, so negatively, and you know, that's why um, uh, things are so bad. No. It's portrayed negatively because things are so bad. It's not that it's portrayed negatively and that's why things are so bad. These pictures which are shown, sometimes of children hungry, etc., they exist, okay? They exist. Now, the African intellectual or the black intellectual would like to sort of downplay that side and focus not on the 70, 80% who are having terribly difficult lives, but focus on the 10, 20% who are doing well. And say, oh, well, why are you guys talking so much about slums and all that and all that? Look, there's this African businessman who built a business worth $2 billion. Fine, but so what? How does that help the millions of people who are there suffering? OK? I understand why they're doing it. They're doing it from a dignity perspective, from a perspective that, look, if the world sees us as simply, like you're suggesting, simply poor, we have nothing to offer, etc., no one will ever respect us, and perhaps even this economic growth will not come, because investors won't come, since they'll think, oh, well, you know, we're so poor, we have nothing to offer anyway. That, that's their argument, that's their perspective. I get that perspective. But at the end of the day, if you're talking, for instance, investors, Investors are not going to, you know, watch uh, CNN to decide whether to go <laughs> invest in a country or not. Right. They're going to look at facts and figures. Yes. What's the average wage? Yes. What's the average income? What kind of disposable income do people have? Are they going to be able to buy my products? Mm. OK? Yes. That's what they're going to look at. So that argument that, oh, sort of um, uh, talking about the realities of Africa is going to scare away investors, and thus we won't get the economic growth, and thus we're perpetuating the poverty, I don't buy that logical sequence. You know. It's the other way around. It? It's the other way around. So it. it is mostly, I know, on their perspective, a, a dignity. Uh, it's a dignity, it's a dignity perspective, it's a dignity argument, yeah? That, oh, we have to sort of speak well of ourselves. And what they will say, I know, to people like me is, look, other people speak well of themselves. They don't speak of their disadvantages or their bad sides, yeah? When the Americans are talking about themselves abroad, they speak about the good things about America. When the British are talking about themselves abroad, they speak about the good things. Well, that's not true. About, about yeah, 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 it's not. <laughs> yeah, it's not. That's the thing, it's not. But that's the way they will present yeah, the something. Yeah, yeah. I say, so why shouldn't we focus on the good sides? Right. You see? That's, so why should we? Because everybody else does it. Yeah. But it's actually not like that. Some of the most critical books you can find in the world about America were written by Americans. Yeah. Yeah? And the Americans who come out every day and say this is a rubbish country, oppressive, racist etc etc just like the way about britain so that but i understand you know the problem they face is that problem of you know where's the balance between self criticism which happens when we are within ourselves okay so if you go read the average um, nigerian newspaper today you will find articles slaying nigerian government policy and often even slaying nigerian society okay but those are articles for domestic consumption yeah yeah the idea is that they're not meant to be read by white people. 
because this will make them even more look down on us. So as long as we know the audience is within our circle, we say the truth. But if we know white people are going to read this, we need to uh, sort of um, uh, spin it a bit. Because if not, we are just giving them more opportunities to look down on us the way you and I know is the way the discussion would go between me and a black person, or the way like they would say to me, the way you and I know, they've always looked down on us. Mm. And now you want to give them even more uh, opportunity to do that? Remy, the other thing I want to touch in terms of a possible solution is, one thing that's always occurred to me is there's almost this original sin mm. of slavery yeah. that's never been addressed, yeah. not really. Like, you know, you talk about the fact that, you know, obviously the vast, vast majority of people of all colors yeah. would say that slavery was wrong, yeah. the, the, specifically the African slave trade, right? Because yeah. there's slavery of all kinds that's been of happening course. for millennia. But people would accept that that's wrong now, but that's never been properly addressed in the sense of, yes, there's been apologies, but there's never been, say, an economic aspect to that, right? Do you think that something like targeted reparations towards people who are the descendants of slaves, maybe like educational vouchers or something, would help to kind of address that unaddressed original sin and kind of help us as a society to move beyond that. Do you think that's possible? That's an interesting point you raise, and there is definitely a, an analogy that could be drawn on uh, to justify uh, such a demand, which would be the analogy of the compensation given to Holocaust survivors mm. and their families. Yeah, sometimes by Swiss banks, for instance, and some of the um, banks who profited off the Holocaust directly. Mm. And there have been compensation uh, um, uh, agreements um, uh, negotiated for the direct descendants right. of those Holocaust, not for all uh, Jewish, uh, people, uh, Jewish people, right. exactly. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's um, uh, there's there definitely an analogy there, and I definitely think there's an argument to be made for that. Mm. There's an argument to be made for that. If you can, like I said, identify going to direct descendants, there's definitely a legal argument probably could come up for that, and there's definitely a moral argument you could come up for that. So it's definitely, yeah, that's an idea, definitely. Because I feel like that would be a big part of a potential solution, because otherwise the resentments and the wariness that you've talked about mm. is always going to be there. Mm. You know, it's like if you've been offended by a person, mm. an individual in mm. your life, and you're really upset about it, and you have every right to be upset mm -hmm. about it, and they've never apologized, mm -hmm. or maybe they've kind of half-heartedly mm -hmm. apologized, they've never compensated you, mm -hmm. they've never offered to make amends, mm -hmm. then it's going to be very difficult to have a constructive relationship with that person. Mm -hmm. And that's why whenever these issues are brought up, I always feel like, I mean, the descendants of slaves have not mm -hmm. been given the, the rightful compensation mm -hmm. for what's happened. Mm -hmm. And if that could be taken care of, I feel like we could move on as a society in a way that we haven't been able to at this point. You know, it's a, that, like I said again, that's, a, that's definitely a hugely interesting idea, and there is definitely a movement in the U.S. Um, uh, um, uh, trying to demand that. Mm -hmm. Of course, it would go into you know, Holocaust survivors, I guess, is easier to identify because it wasn't that long ago. Mm -hmm. So there's still some people even still alive, yeah. and their children definitely, or grandchildren definitely yeah. still alive. Uh, a bit more difficult, I mean, with slavery, you'd have to go back, you know, trace records, etc. So who would actually get the compensation? Would it be the African-Americans, or would it also extend to some of their African descendants in Africa? Right. Okay? Uh, so practically, obviously, it would be much more difficult, um, uh, it would be much more difficult to do. But I definitely agree with you that from a symbolic point of view, of sort of... Um, um, an olive branch, let's say, uh, in this case, cash. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best kind of a olive cash, branch. A cash, a cash branch, <laughs> uh, you know, would, um, uh, would go a long way towards um, uh, definitely addressing some of these emotions. And most importantly, would remove some of the um, um, emotional impact or some of the psychological advantages which the identitarians have right. who are trying to drive that permanent wedge. Yeah. They'd have one less argument, mm. okay? They'd have one less argument. So people would be able to say, okay, fine, but you say these white people are so bad. Uh, okay, we know what they've, did in, they've done in the past and all that, but at least, you know, they've now trying to address this by ABC. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, that's so, you know, some people listening will be like, oh, yeah, maybe these, you know, identity guys are taking it too far because after all, these people have given some compensation. Now, what else do you want them to do? Mm. You know. Uh, so, yeah. So from that point of view, as in one, addressing some of the issues and weakening the position of those who want to simply 
whose careers are built essentially mm -hmm. on driving that wedge and saying, look, we black people are victims, these white people are bad, etc., etc." Even though, funny enough, all these um, uh, identitarians, I've never seen any of them who's, um, uh, who go to a black publisher to publish their books. Mm. <laughs> they always go to white publishers. Why? Because the white publishers are, white publishing companies are the biggest ones who can make you famous and make you sell loads of books. But if you're talking about strengthening, um, uh, you're talking about black power and strengthening, you know, black economic something, why not go to a black publishing company? Such exist. It's not like there are no black-owned publishing companies that, you know, that exist. There are some which function on the market. They are definitely in Africa, and I would, I'm almost 100% sure that there are some black-owned publishing companies in America. So why don't these black identitarians go to black publishing companies to publish their books? Of course not, because those ones, one, can't pay them as much for their books, and two, can't make them as famous as the, you know, let me not mention names. Uh, as the, um, hey, why not? This is the whole point of the show. As you laying into some people. That's as the best the, thing. As the, <laughs> as the huge, uh, as the huge I mean, white publishing company can. So you see here some of the, you know, irony and some of the hypocrisy of the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. you know, I'm here complaining about how terrible, you know, white people are. But at the end of the day, you know, I'm going to a white uh, publishing company in public because I know they're the ones who can make me famous and eventually, you know, rich or semi-rich. Mm. You know, beside the that's a side issue maybe. If I ever want to start an argument on the internet, or if anybody starts an argument on the internet, all they need to do is put two words together, white and privilege, and all of a sudden it explodes and, you know, you've got people from different sides and of the argument, and it normally gets incredibly heated. Mm. I mean, what is your opinion of this? Do you think, A, is it exists, is it a thing, and how big a problem is it in our society? <laughs> So Britain you're talking about? Yes, Britain. Absolutely. Um, or the US as well, if you want to yeah, delve into the, that. Let's so, say the West. Look, yeah, let's the West. I, I'll definitely say that um, uh, white skin colour is a strong negotiating currency in global interactions. OK? For instance, if a white man goes into, walks into a Nigerian police station and complains about a crime being committed against them, that crime will be taken much more seriously, that report will be taken much more seriously than if a Nigerian was to go into that police station and complain about the same crime, okay? So why is that? It's because there definitely is, and now I'm starting with an example, like I said, in Nigeria. It's because the Nigerian policeman definitely instinctively believes that, you know, um, white people are important. Okay. I'm going to interrupt you there just for yeah. one second because in Russia, where I'm from, right, yeah. if uh, a, a Nigerian or, yeah. or a British man walked into a police station yeah. to, to report a crime, yeah. a foreigner, yeah. that would also be taken more seriously. Wouldn't it depend because, on what type of foreigner? Is it not that the Westerner would be taken yes, more seriously? Westerner. The Westerner. But that Westerner see. could be black. That Westerner Fair could enough. be Latino. I know. But I'll it's get a Westerner. To, I'll get to, I'll, right. I'll get to, I'll get to what you're saying. Yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah. a good point. I'm, I, I, I know where you're going to. So... Essentially, the um, uh, Nigerian pol the police force, they believe that you know, white people are important. Now, why? Is it just because of the skin color? Just because the skin color looks like that? No. It's because of the perception that white people are generally rich and generally powerful. Mm. Okay? That's why they're important. Not because they're white, but because of the resources that are imagined to be behind them. Right. Okay? So the Nigerian policeman there would assume that, well, first of all, we should take this guy's case seriously because, you know, he might know some important people here, for instance. There might be some consequences if we don't take the case seriously, etc. It's not because of the white skin color. It's because of the resources they imagine behind that white person who walked into the police station. Whereas if it was a Nigerian person who, if they don't identify that, oh, this is a rich guy here, they'll just, you know, dismiss that, you know, well, we don't have to take this serious and there'll be no consequences. And this leads to what you were talking about, as in uh, why, for instance, in Russia, if a Western person, a Western citizen uh, walks in, they will be taken more seriously. For instance, a black American, they will be taken a hundred times, I'm sure, more seriously than if a Nigerian walks into a Russian police station, oh. because the black American is an American citizen, right. okay? So because there's that perception that, you know, behind this guy, there are resources, there's political power, there's economic power. So we have to take this person seriously. It's the same thing exactly, for instance, in Poland, you know. Western people, you know, walk somewhere, etc. It's taken very seriously because oh, this is a British person, oh my God. Mm. Polish police would also take 
probably more seriously the case of a British person than the case even of a Polish person, you know. So, so these, are, these are dynamics which come into play, like I said, based on resources, etc. And it so happens that it's white people who control a lot of the resources, etc. That's why this preferential treatment comes in, because that preferential treatment definitely exists, okay? So that's in the, in the let's say, a Nigerian setting. So if we come, let's say, to the setting here in the UK, <clears throat> clearly, a group which uh, constitutes 87% of, like, UK's population will have advantages, OK? We'll find it easier to, you know, get jobs, etc. And why might that be? Let's say, for instance, you go apply for a job. Recently, I was on um, uh, Sky News a couple of um, uh, weeks ago uh, talking about there was a shortage of, or there is a shortage, sorry, of senior, manage, senior minority uh, managers in the NHS. So I spoke to a couple of uh, people I know in the NHS who are in high executive positions, both black and white, on why they think this is the case. And what was interesting, what some of the black people um, told me, they said, look, you know, you come, obviously, to be even called for an interview on such a level, you know, senior management position in the NHS, this means there's already an assumption that you are qualified to do the job. Because if not, you won't even be called in for the interview anyway. OK? So based on your CV, they've seen this guy is qualified to do the job. Then you come in, then they make a short list, et cetera. Now, the whole crux of the matter comes in who in that short list is going to be chosen. So let's say you have four or five people. Let's say one is black, one is Asian, three are white. What are the thoughts that are going to be going through the head of the mostly white panelists or all white panelists uh, in making that final decision? We know all these five guys can do the job. They're all qualified. Now, thoughts will start to enter of, OK, who do we think we'll have the smoothest working relationship with? OK? In answering that question, we'll start to come now imaginations of cultural affinity. OK? Am I going to be able to get along with this guy, you know, almost without words? Because that's the kind of person I want to work with. Yeah? I don't want to work with somebody who, you know, I'll be worried whether I can say this or I can't say that, or should I say it this way or shouldn't I say it that way? Every culture has its code. Like, you know, for instance, in Russia, there's a way Russians can communicate with each other without words that a foreigner will never understand if just reading the words. You'd be like, what was communicated here? Yeah? But the Russian knows exactly what was communicated. Uh, and here now come in questions of, ah, okay, so you know, most probably will get along better with the white guy, because, I mean, he's white like us. He probably, you know, grew up in a, a sim not probably, grew up in a similar culture, probably has similar worldviews to us, similar attitudes towards, you know, I don't know, work, different um, uh, um, uh, kind of things, and it will simply probably be easier for us to get along with that white person. And on that, dis on that basis, a decision can be made to employ a white guy instead of, let's say, for instance, uh, someone who came to Britain from Nigeria 20 years ago and has exactly the same qualifications, yeah? Now, that decision is not... I'm not saying sometimes it's not based on racism. Probably it is. Uh, but sometimes it's not based on the fact that, oh, I think this black guy is a worse person or will not be able to do the job. But it's based on the fact that I simply think I'll get along better with the white guy. Yeah? And now, these are not thoughts that only go through the heads of white people. In Nigeria, for instance, you know, where there's ethnic divisions uh, and regions of the country have vastly different cultures in Nigeria, for instance. It's a huge country, four times the size of the UK, four times the size of the UK, not of England, of the entire UK, uh, almost 200 million people. So in the northern region, there's a different culture, for instance, than in the southern region. OK? And very often, also, when decisions are made, for instance, in Nigeria, based on who to employ, etc., these kinds of considerations are taken into account. My father was an architect. He ran his own architectural firm in Nigeria. He only employed people from within his own ethnic group, not because he hated the people from other ethnic groups, but he simply made an automatic assumption that, you know, um, He'd have a smoother working relationship with people from his own ethnic group. Same culture, we understand each other. I don't need to say much, OK? I say one, two words, they know what I mean. Yeah. That's, why, that's why it is. I can't remember anybody, I'm talking about a few dozen people, um, I had my dad, who were not from his ethnic group. Mm -hmm. And it's not because others from other ethnic groups did not apply, or because my dad hated those people from those ethnic groups, you know? So these are the kinds of mechanisms 
that could happen like in a setting here that the word they'll go for the, you know. And then it will be identified as, oh, it's racism. It's because they think the black person is worse or they don't want to work with the black person. No, it's a preferential choice. Now, of course, this disadvantages people like me or could disadvantage people like me or other black people. So I'm not surprised that, you know, nobody's going to just say, ah, well, okay, fine. Since it's just about cultural affinity, then we understand, then it's okay. Obviously, you can't expect minorities to, to adopt that position because this disadvantages them, yeah? But I'm just trying to show how some of the mechanisms behind such decisions are not based on, oh, I think black people are worse or I don't want to work with black people, yeah? Or other minorities, but on these, you know, um, uh, cultural preferential treatments I'm talking about. Of course, the question would be, you know, what's the solution? Because it's unfair, obviously, if um, uh, qualified uh, black people or Asian people are disadvantaged because the white person making the decision, you know, assumes they will work better with a fellow white person. So to well, well, the thing is, with that is, is what you're talking about, I mean, it doesn't sound to me like it's actually got anything to do with race whatsoever. That same thing... Sometimes it might. Th it might, I'm but, not saying it doesn't, but, but yeah. what, I, what I'm saying is that same thing would apply to class. Yeah. So a group of middle-class people mm -hmm. seeing a working-class person... Mm -hmm. Or the BBC, right. <laughs> as yeah. they like to be known. Sure. Yeah, they would Could then you, go, yeah. this person, we can't get on with him, he's working-class. Of course. What does he know about, you know? Of course, definitely. And it, it, a it, Russian it was, would yeah. be in the same position because they'd be like, well, he didn't grow up here, he didn't understand. Of course, know. of right. course. And I mean, they're Poles. Look, if they say this thing is, okay, white, aha, uh, another point. If they say, okay, this thing is, oh, the white privilege, white privilege, etc. I know Polish people here mm. who came to this country mm. with master's degrees in economics mm. and were washing plates for five years. Sure. Yeah. So okay? Yeah. Why? Because, one, their English wasn't that good. Mm. And during job interviews for their, you know, specialization, economics, etc., they weren't able to convince the usually British employer that, you know, I can do this job and I'll understand instructions immediately, mm. you know. Because, you know, nobody has time to start explaining things to you all because you're an immigrant, so I'll take an hour to explain things to you. Unfortunately, it's a brutal world, capitalism. Nobody has time for that. Mm. People want, I want somebody who I say A and they understand the rest of the sentence. So I know Polish people like that who... So how has their white skin helped them here in Britain? Mm. In no way has it helped them, OK? The British employer is not interested that, oh, Polish guy, you are white, ah, so I'll employ you. Of course not, you know, if you don't speak the language. A black Briton who's finished a good university here in Britain is advantaged over the white Pole if they both have economics degrees, mm. yeah? The black Briton who, you know, grew up here, knows the cultural codes, went to a good university, will be hugely advantaged over a white Pole who came here, has the same economics degree, but, you know, doesn't uh, maybe speak English that well and can't, doesn't know, you know, those British cultural codes and all that that well. Mm. Yeah? So, you know, what would we call that then? Yeah. No, I totally agree. Do you think, do you think we've gone too far in entertaining the uh, black identitarians that you talk about and identity politics in general? Uh, what do you mean by that, too far? Uh, I, mean th I, I'm, I mean that we are starting to see... Like, I saw on my Facebook feed, someone sent me this morning, that uh, the government has an initiative to change the ethnic makeup of the firefighting service. OK. Because it doesn't reflect some, whatever it is, diversity quotas that they have. And in, in that kind of situation, you know, most people, I suspect, would think, well, hey, I don't care what colour my sure. fireman is, I just want him to drag me out of sure. the bloody fire. Sure, right? sure, sure. Look, these are um, uh, tricky issues. I, I've had such an experience. Um, uh, my wife recently had a surgical procedure. Uh, and I remember when we were in the hospital in Sheffield there, you know, uh, the last thing on my mind was what's the skin color of the people running this hospital or the doctors or the people who are turning to her. That was the last thing on my mind. <laughs> All I cared about was that, you know, um, these are people who are competent and good at their job, mm. OK? So that's one side of it. The other side of it, and I definitely think is a legitimate argument, is if there are, let's say, specific organizations or institutions, OK, where after really going in and doing research, not just something we read in newspapers, but after going in and doing research and studying, you know, recruitment processes and all that, how people are employed, what kind of people applied, how many were something, there seems to be a clear tendency to sort of dismiss um, uh, minority applicants, sure. 
then of course I believe that should be looked I think into. Everyone does. You know, how do we? Okay, why is this happening? Yeah. How do we redress this, etc. Yeah. Of course. So I can't say much um, uh, regarding the fire um, um, fire brigade and uh, team because I don't know. You know what made the government come up with that kind of sure. come up with that kind of something? You know, I would assume. Uh, that they, you know, did some kind of studies and did some kind of research uh, before they came up with that, you know, proposal. Yeah, yeah. I was going to, it was going to lead on to the question because this is something that I've tossed and turned over in my head many, many times. Do you believe in quotas? Do you think uh, we should impose on employers? You should impose. You should employ this percentage of women. You should employ this percentage of ethnic minorities. Or do you think that the market should be allowed to sort itself out? To be honest with you, I don't have a clear. Um, I'm, I'm an agnostic on that position, on that issue. I don't really have a clear. Uh, I don't really have a clear opinion on that issue in the sense that my opinion has shifted over the years. So there have been moments I might wake up on a Monday and think um, uh, quotas are a terrible idea. It's, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Come on. Mm. Um, uh, why should a company be forced to etc. etc. But then I read an article on a Wednesday um, uh, which makes a persuasive argument for why, let's say, in institution A, there were no possibilities for, let's say, women uh, to get jobs. But after um, Imp the imposition of quotas, those women have, you know, there's been a greater um, participation of women, and the results of the institution have improved. And, you know, and then I read that and I'm like, it seems this quota thing isn't such a bad idea after all. Uh, so, yeah, so honestly speaking, I don't have a clear cut uh, idea that I would say probably it should go on a case by case basis. On a case by case case basis, I definitely probably wouldn't support a you know blanket quota you know everywhere you know 30, 50 percent of the women in parliament must be women, 50 percent of the people in parliament or the MPs must be women or 21.2 percent uh, should be black etc. I definitely wouldn't support something like that. But on a case by case basis, looking at specific institutions, organisations, looking at the history, how things have worked there, then I think definitely I mean it, it, it's not something I would dismiss and say oh it's a rubbish idea. So moving on, um, you're obviously a political journalist and you were based in Poland and mm. Eastern Europe. Um, and we've seen the rise of populism mm. happen more and more in those countries, yeah. whether it's Hungary, it's Poland and all the rest of it. Why do you think this is happening? Is it to do mm. with the EU? <coughs> is it to do with, you know, the, the, you know, the, the situation in the, mid in the Middle East or Syria? W w why do you think it's happening? In, is, is it something we should be worried about? I'd say definitely yes. Um, in Poland, uh, currently there's a hardcore right wing, um, uh, right wing, um, xenophobic, I'd call them. Uh, I try to use that word sparingly, uh, but definitely it applies in this case, um, uh, government. So, okay, I'll just tell you briefly how they came into power. So, uh, they won elections, they've been in power since 2015. And that was, of course, the year of the migrant crisis. Mm. OK, now, this party before, for reasons completely unconnected with migrants or immigration, etc., were already in a good position to win the elections. OK, because Poland had had a ruling party, a liberal ruling party for eight years. People were tired of it. There'd been some corruption scandals, etc. So there was already fertile ground for this opposition party to win those elections. OK, so during the summer of 2015, the elections were in October, if I recall um, correctly, of 2015. During the summer, they were ahead of the Liberal um, Party, but by a few points. <laughs> then the migrant crisis um, erupted, and they, you know, went into that hardcore, as in the leader of the party came out and said, we shouldn't be accepting any refugees or migrants into Poland. They could be carrying, I mean, terrible things, saying like, oh, they could even be carrying diseases and all that, you know, which are terrible allusions to, you know, what used to be said about the Jews in Nazi Germany, etc. You know, basically, that's playing on the most fundamental fear of people, mm -hmm. you know, that these guys could come and give you a disease, mm -hmm. yeah. which could make you die, you know. What's more scary than that? Uh, so they, you know, played into this um, uh, tropes uh, very strongly. Immediately they do that. I knew they'd won the elections. I knew they'd won the elections, unfortunately. <clears throat> and as it happened in October, uh, it, ca uh, it came that they did win the elections. So I'd say that definitely added a few points 
uh, to them, even though most probably they might have even won the elections even without that. So what happened is when they saw that, wow, people are really responding to this stuff, yeah, that they might be in, because you know, they were talking then, the previous government then the liberal government who they ran against had agreed to accept 7,000 uh, refugees. Just 7,000. No, 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 that's just 7,000. Yeah. And, uh, and this government said, oh, and th these guys who are ruling now during the campaign said, oh, yeah, but that's how they start. They say 7,000, and then, you know, people come in and they bring in their brothers and sisters and cousins, and before you know it, it's 100,000. Yeah? And then before you know it, it's a million. So that's how they uh, played on that. And they said, so we are accepting zero. That's our policy. So they won the elections. And then when they saw, wow, some people really like this stuff, they're really responding to it. Then they even started going further. And then they were, you know, when there were attacks, I, you remember 2016, there was, you know, the attacks in France and all that, you know. And then, you know, their ministers would come out and say, well, you know, we, we've said all along this multiculturalism is a ridiculous idea, you know. You guys see now how right we were not to allow these Muslim folks to come, you know, into Poland and all that, because probably, you know, Poland now would be like France now, you know, where, you know, there's people running around with AK-47 shooting people in cafes. Uh, and, you know, obviously, you know, that fear, etc. And those attacks sort of reinforced their message. And people were like, oh, they probably had a point, actually, you know. Uh, and they've been riding on that since then. Uh, and definitely they've sort of unleashed, you know, at the end of the day, Bertrand Russell, I think it was, who, who uh, wrote in the history of Western philosophy that uh, the history of humanity has been one of the battle between reason and passion within the individual human, yeah? And that for some people, uh, the victory of reason over passion comes without much pain. For some people, it comes with a lot of pain. And restraining those passions, they find inhibitive and even psychologically difficult to accept. They want to be able to release themselves and vent in public and not have to pretend and act all polite and civilized and all that. And I do believe very strongly, you know, he got, um, uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot to that. And so I think when this rhetoric started in Poland, it simply allowed a lot of people who had been dissatisfied with various aspects of liberalism from its attitude to immigration to its attitude to um, gay rights and things like that, because Poland is a very conservative society compared to a country like uh, Britain, mm -hmm. incomparably so. Yeah. I'll give you an example. I hope I'm not varying off too much. I tend to do this. Uh, in Poland, no leftist party has dared to postulate for uh, gay marriage. Here in the UK, the conservatives supported it. Yeah. Yeah. So you see, yeah. you see that the difference. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh, so this, um, uh, when they started their rhetoric, it allowed a lot of people who'd been hiding feelings which they had on various topics regarded to liberalism and, you know, freedom and all that, to be able to come out and say, oh, yes, finally now I can say this. You know, I've never really liked this. Muslims can't stand gays and think, you know, the West has basically gone crazy, you know. And these are really emotions which people feel. That they're not manufactured because very often people try to sort of uh, act as if, oh, is this elites who manufacture, the, you know, they tell people things and then people like robots say, ah, okay, immigrants bad, aha, immigrants bad, you know, gays bad, ah, gays bad. No, it doesn't work that way. There has to be a feeling inside you, yeah, that is already leaning towards that direction. And then when the politician comes out and says, you know, Constantin, it's okay to think immigrants are bad. I like the way he's picked me for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're the Russian, right? <laughs> <laughs> you see, you, see, you know, because it's okay yeah. to think immigrants are bad because they really are. Mm. Don't be afraid of saying that. Come on, be yourself, be free. You know, Come on. and then <laughs> you know. So, so, so well, that's that's what. Right. <laughs> 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 so, so that's what that's what they played on, you know, yeah. and and it's working. Yeah. So, in to so your 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 question was, um, uh, is it a problem? I think definitely it's a problem because there's a lot of nastiness there. Mm. I mean, there are of course polls who are opposed to this to this. Yeah. But, you know, and it gives a lot of people sort of satisfaction, you know. There's a human satisfaction in feeling that I am better than somebody else, mm. okay? Yeah. So if you are a broke guy uh, who hasn't, and I'm not saying this disparagingly, I'm just, uh, as a fact, yeah. if you're somebody who, let's say, is 
let's call it economically frustrated. Yeah. Uh, things haven't gone well for you in life. Uh, you don't have such a high level of self-esteem and all that. And then a politician comes to you and says, look, forget about your individual status. You are a superior being simply for the fact that you were born a Pole. That alone makes you better than all those Muslims and all those brown people and all those Africans and all those people. That alone should give you pride, you know. And you're like, yeah, you know, I am something at the end of the day, yeah? And, you know, it works very strongly, especially on people like that who have that low sense of, of self-esteem. And then you tell him that, oh, actually, you don't have to have any achievements in life individually. Mm. All you have to do is have been born Polish. That alone makes you a somebody, you and, know. It's and, automatic, and no it, effort on your part. And it goes back to, I, I presume, to what you are studying, which is group identity. <laughs> which is, yeah, yeah, definitely, and it, yeah. And it gives them an identity and therefore a sense of self-worth. No, of course, no, there's various social identity theories um, uh, which persuasively, I would say, um, uh, argue that, you know, a lot of uh, our individual self-esteem often, in many people, if not most, is uh, derived from the group they belong to and the group esteem, you know. There are some people who are able to sort of derive that sense of self-esteem, and in a, it depends on also the dynamics, political dynamics, from their individual achievements, yeah? I did this, I did that, I did this. OK? But a lot of people really, it actually, especially if you don't have those individual achievements, if you can't say, oh, I have this, or I've done that, or I've done this, or I've done that, then you are looking for something to give you that esteem. And then somebody gives it to you on a platter of gold. Dude, you don't have to have done anything in your life. The fact that you were born British or Polish makes you a superior person already. That's all you need. Come on, who wouldn't want that? It's easy, man. See, this is why I think the, the traditional kind of classical <laughs> liberalism yeah. is such a powerful antidote to identity <clears throat> politics. Because if you teach people that your value and your status and everything about your life depends on your individual yeah. behavior, on how you <laughs> conduct yourself, on what yeah. you yourself achieve, then people who are in that position, who understand the world through that lens, yeah. they're never going to be drawn to the racism of the far right yeah. or to this identitarianism of the yeah. far left because they understand that fundamentally it's your job as a human being to take the circumstances in which you're born and to do the best possible that you can in those circumstances. And I think that's why we talk about these issues with a lot of people because I think that message of individual responsibility has to be spread as far and wide as possible, in my opinion, because the, we, there's, the identity politics on the right and left, I think, is very dangerous. It's dangerous on both sides. I agree. The problem with that, um, uh, with, that um, uh, with, with what you propose is that it's difficult. Oh, yeah. It's difficult. Yeah. It's what is easier for me to say, OK, my life depends on my individual um, uh, effort mm. and what I have done, mm. OK? And if, let's say, I haven't uh, reached a stage in life or I don't have the kind of esteem within society that I thought I would have, mm. then probably this is my fault. Is that easier to do? Or is it easier for me to believe that if there is something going on in my life which, if I'm not where I want it to be, then it's because of somebody else. Of course, that second option is much easier. It's much more attractive. It's much more seductive, yeah. OK? Telling people, look, it depends on you, <laughs> that's putting, you're pushing the responsibility on people. That's difficult, mm. OK? Because then there's no excuses. There's no one to blame, yes. you know? People don't want that very often. People don't want that. They want to be able to say, look, it's not my fault. Come on, something. Somebody must have caused these problems, you know? And that's why right-wing populism and stuff, you know, is so seductive. Because you, are, you take, you sort of lift the burden of responsibility from the individual, you know, and say, oh, it's not your fault. It's because of these people. Right. You're you not know. unemployed because you, you haven't studied well. Oh, you're lazy. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're unemployed, unemployed because, because of immigrants. Because, because they're immigrants, you understand. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, wow. Oh, so I'm not that crap after all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. it's seductive. Yes. Yeah. Well, listen, it's been an absolutely eye-opening to be. It's been fantastic to have you on. You're probably one of the, mo the most intelligent and kind of nuanced guests. We, we tried to take you, get you to take some extreme positions, but <laughs> you always had a bit of nuance and you always had a bit of balance. So it's been uh, really great. I'm incredibly Thank sweaty at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but it's been fantastic. The question we always like to end on is, is there one thing that you think we as a society aren't talking about that we ought to be talking about? 
Um, not really, honestly speaking. I mean, the, the big issue, which I think, apart, I, I think there's two issues which are going to sort of um, shape political discussion in the next five, ten years, and that's identity and inequality. Mm. Okay, uh, we talked about the identity issue today, and there's a lot of talk about identity politics. The second issue is inequality, and I can't say. Uh, I mean, whatever um, uh, you, 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 you may think of, of him right now, et cetera, but, you know, Corbyn and Labour, et cetera, they've been attacking that issue very strongly, and they've been talking about it very strongly, which I think is one issue which Labour is winning on right now, the inequality issue. The Conservatives are winning on the identity issue. Mm. Uh, Labour is winning on the inequality Wait, issue. Wait, hold on. Sorry, to, how are the Conservatives winning on the identity issue? That's They're winning on the identity issue because um, uh, the Conservatives, you know, won, uh, have sort of at least, you know, in official rhetoric, and said, look, we respect the Brexit decision of the British people to leave the European Union. So basically, we accept that um, uh, British people, I don't know, want to stay British or are more British than European, uh, however you may uh, choose uh, to portray that. So we accept that, mm -hmm. definitely, OK. Uh, two, clearly, I would argue, um, uh, the Conservative Party have always placed more emphasis on things like patriotism, you know, loving Britain, mm -hmm. Etc. Yeah, than for instance um, uh, the left, which is usually very critical. Yeah, so on these issues, I would say I'm probably a, I don't know if there's been such a survey, but I would assume that if Brits were asked, for instance, which is the more patriotic party, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty much sure they would say the Conservatives are the more patriotic party, the Tories are the more patriotic party. Uh, whereas if they were asked which is the party which is addressing inequalities more or talking about inequalities more, right. they would probably say it's Labour talking about inequalities more. Sure. You know. So the party, the, the political movement, which is able to provide an adequate response to these two issues, owns the political future in Britain and in Europe and in the West. Fascinating. Thank you so much for coming on. Before we let you go, uh, your Twitter handle is? Uh, at Remy Adekoya1. Perfect. So we'll send everybody your way. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for tuning in this week. We've got more fantastic interviews coming up. We hope you enjoyed it. And we'll see you soon. Yeah, and there'll probably be a new presenter because I'll be fired. So <laughs> <laughs> see you yeah. later. Yeah, mate, I'll fire you right live on camera. <laughs> yeah. No, and uh, as always, remember to subscribe to our channel if you enjoy it. And... If you're already subscribed, remember to click that bell button next to the subscribe button so that you get notified whenever we release a fantastic interview like this. We're on uh, Twitter and other social media at TriggerPod. Follow us, comment, uh, suggest new guests for us to talk to, and have a good week.